Yes, I believe you are live. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Schimpflug. I'm very happy to see you here at our Economists Talk session for the ELSA. We are very, very happy today to bring to you Lee Badgett. And Lee Badgett is a professor of economics, and she's situated in Massachusetts. And Lee will be talking to us about her new book today. And the book is called The Economic Case for LGBT Equality, Why Fair and Equal Treatment Benefits Us All. And before that, I would like to say a few words about you. Please correct me if I say something wrong. You studied economics in Chicago, right? And then you went on to go to Berkeley for your PhD. That's yes. And now you're a professor at UMass Amherst. And you're also working for the Williams Institute. And you're doing so many other things that I cannot even list them. You're a consultant for various NGOs, international uh, organizations, and traveling a lot, used to anyway, not so much right now. Right. And before we get into all those interesting, fascinating things you do and all your work, will you tell us, I mean, I've been asked this many times myself, why did you choose to become an economist? Yeah, that's a great question. I think people have really different kinds of answers. Um, from my perspective, a lot of it was about politics and being concerned about equality and gender equality in particular, and as kind of an early driver. Um, you know, my my dad worked a, did a job that involves employee benefits, and we used to talk about, you know, why people got in the United States get some of their their compensation as part of healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, talking about unions, actually most of the time we debated these things, right? So, um, so uh, and, and as a, growing up as a girl, I knew that, uh, that there were things that I wasn't supposed to do because I was a girl. And uh, I was always very much, you know, kind of in fighting that and uh, had some early experiences. Actually one I talk about in the book where my very first job I got hired at a retail store into the toy department. Um, and uh, we also would ring up the sporting goods department right next door, all of their, uh, all of their sales. And I, this, this guy I went to high school with was working there one day. And I found out from him that not only did they get a commission, but they got paid more than we did in the toy department. So <laughs> I went to our manager who managed both departments. And I said, hey, I wanna change into the sporting goods department. I'm an athlete. I know a lot about sports. I played different sports all my life. I can, you know, I would be a good salesperson. He said, well, I don't know. We did once have a girl working there. It didn't work out so well. So I'll have to think about it. And uh, I never heard from him again. So I, I found a better job and, and quit. But, but that experience and some other experiences that I had in the labor market um, really made me think a lot about discrimination. So I wanted to find a way that I could study that and economics seemed like a really good way to do that. So that's really what pulled me in more than anything else was this, this you know, desire to learn about inequality and to figure out how I could make some kind of contribution to trying to end it basically. Oh wow, so you really wanted to do this. This is... <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> this was why I did it, exactly. So, you know, I went to this, this uh, uh, my my first my university program for a bachelor's degree was at this place that's known for being really conservative in terms of its economics and you know so that's all right I survived that but when I wanted to study more to to get a PhD I looked around for places that I could actually study um, gender differences in the labor market and that's how I ended up at Berkeley I worked with a professor there named Claire Brown who had done a lot of work on on uh, gender in the labor market and. Uh, and found some other really great advisors there. And, uh, and actually, I don't know about you, but um, what made a huge difference for me was having um, uh, a bunch of colleagues who were interested in these issues. So uh, um, many people that I was in study groups with had similar interests. And, um, and, and so it was a great place to, to really think about, um, to think about economics, making it more feminist, making it more anti-racist. 
Um, at that time, nobody was really thinking about queer issues or LGBT issues at all, really. But but starting out thinking about discrimination, I think was, was for me anyway, the gateway into to thinking about LGBT issues. Right. I mean, I was studying at the University of Vienna and just being a woman in economics was crazy enough. You know, you never got to yeah. speak during a lecture when it was Q&A, they wouldn't, you know, most women wouldn't raise their hand and then the professor would always kind of shut you down. So it was, yeah. it was very uncomfortable. And I mean, being in Chicago, it must have been a little bit like that, I assume, right? You know, there were a lot of uh, women who were, uh, who were economics majors. There weren't very many, I don't think there were any professors. Maybe I had one visiting professor who was a woman, but that was it really. So yeah, so that was really, that was really kind of rare. And, uh, you know, it was very noticeable. Um, and when I went to, to grad school, I remember, I remember thinking about how, you know, we really needed a new kind of, of feminist economics. And, uh, you know, the timing was just right, I think, for both of us in a lot of ways, where that was also kind of bubbling up in the profession, which is still, even now, uh, many decades later, is still very male dominated. I mean, you go to the, you know, I have this, I call it the the bathroom gender equality test. Like if you're at a conference and you have a break and you need to go to the toilet, you know, is there a line at the women's room? <laughs> In economics, no. Sociology, yes. <laughs> Psychology, yes. Economics, no. Um, that's changing a little bit, but it's 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 just taken a really long time for, for our field to, to, to change. Yes, and then you got kind of sucked into feminist economics or, or what was first, was it, queer economics or feminist economics or did that go at the same time or how did you end up doing that work that you're doing I mean for those of you who don't know Lee is the world's most well-established just lesbian economist that's right to say right I could say that yes I mean we'll be talking about role models you were definitely one of my role models I mean you were out there and like two, three others, and then there's nothing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really amazing. I mean, you can study economics anywhere in the world and everywhere it's the same textbooks and the same agenda. And there's so little of other things going on like lesbian economics, feminist economics, black economics, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so you're really one of the first and few people out there. So how did that happen? I mean, that's really crazy. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, well, it's there was a pretty logical progression for me. Um, so my dissertation was on racial differences in unemployment and unemployment and employment opportunities. And I had kind of a gender component to that as well. And uh, so I was well grounded in the way economists think about why people have different earnings, for example. And um, and and I think there's sort of the two things that uh, the two things outside of economics that came together for me, which are frankly much more important than what happened within economics. I mean, one of them is I started doing more reading of uh, what's going on in other fields. So uh, historians are starting to do serious research, a serious scholarship on LGBT issues. And and I read a book by John D'Amelio about the early LGBT rights movements in the U.S. And it kind of um, got me thinking more about my own activism at the time in grad school and, uh, and thinking about it more consciously as a lesbian for me. And, uh, and so when I started my first job, I also was in the Washington DC area in the early 1990s, which is when the kind of current iteration, I would say of the LGBT rights movement was really just starting up. And so I met a lot of people who are working in that movement and, uh, you know, was listening to the debates and the questions and, uh, and the question kind of floated up into the, uh, into the debate about, you know, are, 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 at this time, everybody just talked about lesbians and gay men, are lesbians and gay men this affluent elite? And some marketing surveys started to be publicized that show, that seemed to show anyway, that the, the gay men in particular were, well-educated, affluent group of people who were, um, you know, taking nice vacations and buying nice houses and fashionable furniture, whatever it is, um, and uh, and that that image was seized on by the conservative movement in the U.S. to say, 
well, if that's the case, then where's the disadvantage? Why do we care? You know, that's not that's not the the picture of a disadvantaged minority who needs some kind of policy uh, help to achieve equality. That's a group that's doing better than everybody else. And so at once they undermine the case for policy and they um, and they drove a wedge or tried to drive a wedge between LGBT people's movements and, and other kinds of movements for equality in the US. So, so for me though, I'm like, oh, that doesn't make any sense at all, <laughs> right? I'm a lesbian, the people I know don't live that life. Uh, I don't think that that's an accurate picture of, um, of who LGBT people are economically. And you know, you can critique the surveys, the marketing surveys that they come from people who have high income. So of course, you know, at the time, you know, people who read magazines and newspapers or who had credit cards, whatever, they were, they were all people who we know are higher income anyway. So, so I could critique it, but I didn't have anything to replace it with. And I thought, well, if I only had some data, I could actually test that. And so I went on this big data search, I found some, and, uh, and I was able to show using the tools of economics that really gay men have an earnings gap compared to heterosexual men who have the same kinds of characteristics. And lesbians at the time, it, the, my first study were maybe a little bit, earned a little bit less than heterosexual women uh, or about the same. We can talk about that because there's a whole interesting kind of story behind that. But, um, but anyway, it really turned that, that image, that stereotype that was emerging on its head. So, so I got, uh, I started talking about it a lot. I was asked to talk about it more and more. And it kind of you know, showed me that we can do research that matters, that can change the debate, uh, that can change how people think about who LGBT people are and what the challenges are that they face. So that was really my, you know, once I started down that path, I really haven't looked back. I'm, you know, kind of still, still walking that path, you know, trying to have that kind of understanding. I mean, that is so amazing, like these myths and stories that are surrounding minorities. For instance, if we talk about, you know, gay guys in the early 90s, there was HIV, there was AIDS, people were dying. And, you know, if you think, oh, these are double income, no kids, you know, like rich people then for sure there's not going to go any money into that group because you think oh those are probably well off anyway so it's it's really really important to dismantle those myths and yeah. unfortunately politicians or maybe maybe luckily we don't know they will listen better if you show them like you know numbers and evidence where it says look at this data and from this data you can see that actually this group of people, for instance, when you look at intersectionality, lesbian women who are not white, who are having children, who are living maybe in the countryside, these are worse off. Look at the numbers. We need to do something for these people. So I think it's an interesting road that you've been taking and it's been a very, very important road. And you've published some books about that, for instance, The Money Myth and Change one of your books from the early 2000s, where you tried to uh, change all these like, ways that society thought about lesbian women and gay men. And as you said, it's very interesting with the lesbian women. And if we look at the gender, yeah. behavior, maybe we should talk about that in a little bit. But first, I would like you to talk a bit about your new book, because that's yeah. right here. So we'll talk a little bit about the book. And I think the book is, um, it's a very cool book and you know, you bring out more and more books in shorter time spans, you know, they keep coming much faster. I don't know how you do it. It's really- I have another one coming out next week. No, just kidding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this one is brand new, right? It came out this year yes. and it's last very month. interesting for last month. Oh my God. So we're really lucky to hear this. And it's, it's a good thing for activists to think about uh, reading this book and working with the book because that book opens uh, ways with that you can actually use for you know going to your politicians and say look blah, blah, and, and it shows you methods how to make good arguments that you should be funded and unfortunately those are arguments that are usually received better than just saying hey we need the money we want to do this and that you know but please tell us about your book yeah, well, I actually, this book exists because of the activists that I've talked to over the years and not just in the US, but in other parts of the world. Um, 
uh, and we can talk some more about that. But but basically, I I was taking this other kind of research that I'd done, which looks at inequality from the perspective of the the lesbian or the bisexual person or the gay man from their perspective and kind of what happens to them individually. But what what we know as economists is that that actually has an impact not just on those people uh, who are experiencing inequality, but it has ripple effects that actually hurt the whole economy. And um, so, uh, so I saw this as an opportunity to op try to open up some space, you know, the, to add to the human rights argument for equality. Um, this other kind of this other kind of more uh, economic focused argument. So it, it goes sort of like this. So the kinds of discrimination that we see against LGBT people, uh, we see in lots of different contexts, but I'm gonna focus on, on the, the three that I think make the biggest difference for the economy. And one is looking at education, looking at employment is the second one, and then looking at health um, is another kind of key area. And what we see throughout this is that when you have when you have bias or stigma, when you have discrimination or violence, what happens is it holds back LGBT people from being able to fully, uh, to, to bring their full selves is one way to think about it, or to, to fully participate in the economy to the extent that they're capable of, uh, or that we're capable of. So um, let's think about education for a second. You know, we have, we have schools that are there to, to teach us how to do all sorts of things. At least one of the reasons for that is because later on in life, you know, we'll, we'll get jobs and we'll use the skills and knowledge that we have um, to, uh, to be part of the economy. And um, um, the problem is that LGBT young people, when they're in schools, often face harassment and bullying either from the other students, actually sometimes from teachers, sometimes from schools themselves. Um, and that, uh, that we know uh, can uh, reduce their ability to get the best education possible. Um, and it might even actually reduce how much education they get. Now, this is, this is something that we see all over the world. Um, one of the things that I was most impressed by when I uh, took on this project was realizing that there's actually a lot of research that's been done. And a lot of it's been done by, by NGOs, by activists who know Kind of like you were what you were saying earlier, you know that there's some power in numbers. If we can demonstrate that you know schools are places where LGBT students don't just learn math and science, they learn you know that they're targets uh, sometimes for uh, for other people. Um, but anyway, so uh, just as an example, UNESCO, one of the UN agencies, gathered studies from 94 different countries around the world to show that the experience of bullying and harassment is very common for LGBT students in every country. Uh, in my country, in your country, the countries of everyone who's listening in, uh, we have this, uh, this challenge, this problem. And, um, and we're, we're learning from at least a few countries with pretty good data that this has bad consequences for people. Um, it's, it's, it's bad for them. It's obviously an unpleasant experience that sometimes can cause stress and health problems, but it also is bad for their performance in school. They don't get as good of grades as they might have gotten um, if they're being bullied. They don't, uh, they don't attend school as frequently, so there's absenteeism. They don't necessarily graduate. They don't want to necessarily go on from on to uh, further education when they have these experiences. So it's bad for the LGBT young people. And it actually, it turns out it's bad for everybody in schools. One of the, uh, one of the studies I looked at, a big multi-country study compared um, bullying in schools to uh, performance on math exams, for example, and showed that all students, uh, students on average in schools that have more bullying do worse on those kinds of, on those kinds of exams. So bullying takes its toll, uh, not just on the LGBT students, but also on everybody potentially. And that's bad for our economies because it means we're, we're not, we're shrinking our potential pool of uh, creative people skilled people, uh, people who are knowledgeable um, to work in our economy. When they get to the workplace, um, we were just, we started to talk a little bit about that earlier, but when they get to the workplace, we know that it's quite common for LGBT people to face discrimination. Um, and uh, again, studies from all uh, across many different countries, different regions of the world show this over and over again. 
I mean, for one thing, we ask people, have you ever experienced discrimination? And in the United States, about one in five LGBT people say, yes, I have experienced discrimination. In Europe, across, a averaging across different countries, about, uh, there was a study that just came out a few weeks ago, actually, from the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU, and um, uh, they showed that one in five, again, one in five LGBT people had experienced discrimination in the last year on average. You know, some countries more, some less. But what's really interesting to me, what's really striking, the most striking thing is that actually that number has actually gone up a little tiny bit from the last time they did a study in 2012. So uh, we think, we hope things are getting better, but still things are not necessarily getting better for people in all parts of the world. So, so people are experiencing discrimination. We see some evidence of wage gaps for gay and bisexual men in lots of different parts of the world. Uh, for, for lesbian and bisexual women, they actually tend to do better than heterosexual women, but that's mainly because heterosexual women are sort of at the bottom of the hierarchy in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of earnings. The lesbian and bisexual women do worse than the gay men, they do worse than the heterosexual men. So there's still a lot, it's kind of like a potentially a double whammy of sexism. And then there are a bunch of interesting studies um, that show that LGBT people um, face discrimination when they're very open. So I'll just give you an example. One, our, our colleague, Doris Weichselbaumer, who's at the University of Linz in Austria, did this great study that's been replicated in other parts of the world. She sent out resumes uh, to, to apply for jobs. And she had uh, a, a way of coding the ones that she wanted people to see as lesbians, uh, saying that they had been involved in a lesbian group in their university, uh, compared to women who didn't have those, uh, uh, that kind of label attached on their, on their CV. So uh, she followed them and found that, uh, that lesbians were much less likely to be invited to uh, have an interview for a job than were the straight women. And the other interesting thing about that is, I don't know if you remember the study, but she kind of varied the gender expression, right? So she had pictures, we, we, in the US we don't put pictures on CVs, but she, had, she put pictures on there and uh, said, uh, she had some of them have long hair with kind of flowing clothes to look kind of funny. Uh, and like they had interests like, you know, playing with children or something like that. And then she had others with a more you know, kind of short haircut and sort of tailored clothing. And they were into uh, motorcycles or something like that, uh, who looked a little more butch. It didn't turn out to actually matter. Both the butch lesbians and the femme lesbians were equally disadvantaged basically compared to the straight women uh, who were applying for jobs. So we see, we, we have all kinds of evidence that shows that, that there's discrimination in the workforce. And again, obviously that's hurting those individuals who experience it, but what it also does is it means it's, it's pushing them into jobs that they are overqualified for, or it might mean that they're unemployed. They're not even getting jobs. We're not even able to use their skills and talents. Um, so we're not, uh, so our economy is not using the skills and talents of people equally and adequately. Uh, so that also holds back the economy. And then lastly, uh, there's issues related to health. So again, all over the world, we have growing evidence that there are disparities between LGBT people and non-LGBT people in terms of really important kinds of health conditions. So the most common ones we see are higher rates of anxiety and depression, the rates of HIV, which you mentioned earlier, uh, more substance use, uh, higher rates of suicidal thinking or some suicidal attempts. Um, and, uh, and more violence, which is also a, a big health problem. So, so those all also take their toll, pulling people out of, the, out of the economy, making them less productive at work because they're having to deal with these kinds of concerns. So, uh, uh, you know, and then I think that the, the really damaging part of it is that all of these are linked, right? So if your health is bad, you're gonna do worse in the labor force, you do worse in the labor force, your health gets worse, you have fewer resources to help you manage health conditions or to get the services and care you need. You're, if you're experiencing bullying in schools, you're gonna have poorer health, which is gonna lead to poorer employment outcomes as well as that more direct link between education and employment. So it's, you know, it's, it's a very complicated situation that's a bad cycle for LGBT people overall. So, 
So my argument is kind of building up from below, thinking about the experiences that, that we have, it puts us in a worse position. So, so then the question is, well, how much does that hurt the economy? And so I'll just, I'll just say there's a couple of ways to think about that. I mean, one is um, if we look at countries that do better, that have better policies and more acceptance in, uh, in public opinion measures, we actually see that those economies do better. Uh, measured by kind of standard ways that economists use of thinking about it, uh, GDP, gross domestic product per person. Um, so that correlation, I think, is very clear uh, and a positive one. And the second way is to try to take each of those little buckets, the education, the employment, the health, and try to attach a value to those disparities, so those differences in treatment. I've done that in a couple of situations. Uh, I did this for the World Bank in India. I did this for uh, uh, just as a side project for the Philippines because I was going there to speak. Uh, some other people have done this for Kenya, for South Africa, and tried to kind of add this up. And basically, what we find is that, roughly speaking, you know, kind of given the range of findings for all these different studies, we're looking at about one percent of GDP being lost to the effects of homophobia and transphobia. Uh, and that's Did actually not included. One percent, that's a lot. Can you put that into like perspective? Yeah. I mean, 1% is really a lot. It's like now with the Corona crisis, we're thinking we're losing, you know, seven percent in Austria yeah. this year. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. That's a lot. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So whenever we see a drop in GDP, we call that a recession. And now we're, you know, we're facing a very steep one. Some are some are worse than others, but the way I think about this is this is a kind of a permanent recession. We're putting ourselves structurally into a position that we are losing out on, uh, on, uh, on economic output and things that make all of our lives better, potentially. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's like a permanent recession, I think. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, we think we're not, a, we're not a huge group, you know, LGBT people overall, but given the the, the, the strength of, of bias and stigma against us and uh, its variation in different parts of the world, I think it's, it's, it's possible that, that people are really, really being held back. Um, that's really what these, what these studies suggest. So, uh, so in the end, you know, it's not just hurting LGBT people, it's really holding back the economy that's really feeding all of us. I mean, the same argument has been made by uh, women economists and feminist economists that, uh, you know, discrimination of women in the economy, in the labor market, will just as much hurt, you know, GDP and economic growth because you're not being efficient in, you know, hiring the best person or, you know, producing as much as you can and basically wasting human resources as dire as that might sound, right? So yeah. it's, it's the same argument. I'm really surprised by you thinking it's 1%. That's wow, that's huge. I think it's huge. And then if yeah. you think about, you know, women who are, you know, working at home for nothing, and that actually has been calculated as being half of GDP, you know, it, it really makes sense, right? You know, the, yeah. the yeah. unpaid labor that's also worth a lot of money and that's not being counted. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it, it must be true. I'm very surprised, very, very cool work, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it is something that's very much in line with the kind of uh, thing that, that some economists have argued for gender. And actually in the US, we've been talking a lot about that recently with regard to racism and uh, Black Lives Matter, that movement sort of people thinking back, actually back in the 1960s, economists were making these arguments related to racial discrimination and to some extent to gender discrimination, but that's a little more recent. And so, yeah, so if you, if, if there was some way that we could put all these together, it would be, it would be obvious that, you know, that the kinds of biases that we have against particular groups or the way we hold women back are, are, are hugely dangerous and detrimental to our economies. I'm just thinking, you know, like the, hmm, a little bit of radical, more radical approach would be saying, yes, I mean, uh, you know, capitalist economies and capitalist economics, it's sucking out, you know, this diversity out of the people to just increase, increase uh, companies' profits, right? So I'm thinking, okay, we increase, you know, the losses, we, we 
minimize the losses of discrimination for LGBT people. We minimize the losses by racism and by, you know, women's discrimination and so on. And then you could say, okay, and then the capitalists will just make more money, right? To maybe <laughs> good resistance, not to give them that. But then I'm thinking maybe it would be good to also frame that argument. I just read it in the newspaper today. Austria is losing 15 million a uh, billion, sorry, this is American. Austria is using, losing 15 billion US dollars every year now that we're not doing anything against climate change. Mm. So I think it, it would be a good argument to say, okay, we'll bring an end to this discrimination and then we will salvage this money that's being lost and we'll use it for something else. I think that could be this more radical stance that we're saying rather than, okay, we'll just feed it into the economy and off it goes yeah. into the pockets of the top 1% shareholders or something like that. So do you think that would be possible? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the hope anyway, certainly, you know, I guess the, the simple way that we think, that I tend to think about it is, you know, there's the pie, you know, what we produce and then there's how it gets divided up. So if, if we make a bigger pie and the only thing that happens is the, the slice gets bigger for, you know, the 1%, that's probably not, uh, not good enough. Um, but I think, you know, what, what we know is that the slices should get at least bigger for LGBT people if they had more protections against discrimination, if there were more efforts to be fully inclusive. Um, yeah, sort of what happens to the rest of it, I guess, is, is a good question. Uh, but I think if you think about the families that LGBT people are parts of, uh, their you know, families of origin, uh, in many cases in different parts of the world, they're, they're making contributions back to their families. You know? So their families have an economic stake very clearly. Well, what about their neighborhoods, their, their local communities? Well, if they've got more money in their pockets and they're spending it locally, that's good for the local communities as well. You know, is it good for the big multinational companies? Actually, yes, there's actually some pretty good research that suggests that, that, the, uh, that there's a business case for LGBT equality. It's a little bit different, you know, kind of focusing on, on businesses. And, you know, that's one reason why a lot of these big multinationals are big supporters of LGBT rights. And increasingly, they're speaking out in other countries about this issue. Uh, outside of the U.S., they've, inside the U.S., they've been speaking out on, in favor of, uh, of equality for quite a while. So, uh, and it's true, the studies show that their profits go up, that their, their productivity goes up, their stock prices go up, and that's, you know, that's good for them. I mean, I think that uh, uh, that in and of itself in my view is not necessarily a reason to not do this. I mean, you know, we live in a world where most people are employed by big companies like that, uh, at least in the US. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we have some interest in them being able to hire people and provide livelihoods for them. So, uh, you know, at the same time, what, a lot of what we're talking about though are, are things that they sometimes have concerns about, you know telling companies what they have to do with policies is something that they sometimes resist. But in this case, you know, being able to show that it's, it's okay for them, you know, to have non-discrimination policies that are enforced, that it's okay to make sure that their benefits plans include gender affirming care and include uh, benefits for same-sex partners, you know, requiring those sorts of things, you know, are good for, uh, for a lot of people who work there. So, uh, uh, and even though they may be things that they resist. So anyway, um, I guess I, I, I'm not too worried if it's also good for businesses. I'm more concerned about it being good for LGBT people. And I think that's really the, you know, uh, the, the underlying case in the book. That's the case for economic equality. Uh, uh, for, um, uh, so that's the economic case for equality, not just the business case, I guess I would say. Absolutely. I mean, of course, it's nicer to work in a company where they will do a pride action or something. Oh, yes, very good. We have a question from Facebook. I can see it this time. What is 1% in real numbers? 1% um, of let's, GDP. That yeah. You know, that yeah. Moving. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I have to know the, the GDP of the United States. Well, I can say in for India. For instance, for the US, your GDP. Yeah. In India, <laughs> when I did this, it was, you know, 30, 30 billion, $30 billion a year, uh, the equivalent in rupees. Uh, 
uh, in the US. Um, and we haven't ever sat down to add that up in the United States. I think you know it could be a bit different, so it's hard to know, but 1% of the US GDP would you know, be hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so, uh, so a lot. It's it's a a lot. Huge, huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. I mean, that's why I was I was really shocked by it. I mean, one percent that causes you know a lot of unemployment that causes ten thousands of people in Austria, which is a small country, to go into unemployment. So it, you know, it, just think about it. All these people who are working in very precarious, not good jobs, or are being unemployed, they could have good jobs if this discrimination wasn't happening because you know GDP always translates into unemployment and unemployment translates into poverty most places anyway and for instance uh, with the Williams Institute you did a lot of work on the census looking at stuff like that right you looked mm -hmm. at how are different intersectional groups affected by for instance where they live and how discrimination plays out maybe you could talk a little bit about that because i was uh, very interested to see what you can actually do with census data it's been always very interesting for activists for instance for myself we did um, a project on working with census data you know census where all the population is asked how are you how much money are you making what is your house status and all this is asked by every household and I remember back in the 80s, we were boycotting the census. We thought the mm. state shouldn't know so much about us. And we cut the bottom of the paper so it couldn't go into the computer and all this. But on the other hand, it's important to say, yes, we want the state to know what different people's situation is, because then that could be used for policy making, right? If you can show certain people have, have it worse than others. So it's it's a little bit of a fine line seeing how much should the state know and what should the state not know. But the US census data is quite amazing. I mean, it's really, you could do a lot with the data. And only quite recently you could see the LGBT, LG, LGB people in the in the census. How did that come? You can see yeah. who is living with whom or how is that working? Right, that's right. Yeah, well, in the US, the way we've talked about this, we've been working very hard, both uh, academics and activists have been working very hard to improve access to data. And the way we put it is, if you're not counted, you don't count. So uh, so uh, in the US, the census data is particularly important. And it's interesting because it, all, it, it was 1990 was the first time where you could identify same-sex couples. So that's basically still all we can see in our actual census data. Um, you can see, you know, it, this, the person who answers the survey, the householder, do they have a other person in the household who says they're an unmarried partner? That was the original question. And, and the Census Bureau did not put that on there so that they could see same-sex couples. They put it on there so they could measure, you know, increasing cohabitation of different sex couples. You know, people who didn't get married, couples who didn't get married, different sex couples. But it turned out that what everybody was interested in were the same sex couples. So that was um, that was kind of the beginning. And now in the current census, uh, it's more or less the same thing, although we'll actually be able to see if couples are married or not married, uh, whether they're same sex couples or different sex couples. But what it meant for us in the research world is that we could compare people who have same sex partners to people with different sex partners. And we could split that because it's such a huge database, right? It's such a huge survey of everybody, the census is of everybody, but mostly we're working with data of a, of a sample that we could split it by male and female. So we could look at men, we could look at women. We could actually even uh, look at, not just at earnings, but we could look at poverty levels, uh, uh, which is something that's, you know, we're talking about a small population of LGBT people and then a relatively small population of that. So you have to have a really huge survey to be able to do that. Um, and, and now we can use that data to look at white people versus black people versus Latinx people versus Asian American people, for example. So, um, so it's really been very important. The downside is we can't measure people who don't have partners. We, we, don't, we can't identify them and uh, it doesn't tell us anything about gender identity. And actually I will just say that what we're learning from other data sets in the US though, is that when we look at people who are same in a same-sex couple, most of them 
do identify as, as gay if they're male or lesbian if they're female. Like bisexual people mostly are partnered with people, uh, with different sex people um, in the US. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. I think. Anyway, so we've yes. learned, yeah. yeah. So we've learned that, you know, the, the men and same sex couples are in less. Uh, we've learned that, learned that women and same-sex couples are more than, than the women and different sex couples. So that's actually been a really super interesting, you know, kind of project that we've had, like to try to explain that. Because if it's discrimination so for the men. If you're a lesbian, you, you earn more? Is that the good yeah. news? Getting from you? Oh my God. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Becoming a lesbian won't necessarily be good for your well-being, but uh but if but straight women who like learn from lesbians actually might see their wages go up. I mean, we think that a lot of it is that um, that lesbians are you know they don't have male partners, so they're not expecting to have a higher earning person to count on. So they are in the labor force more. They actually do work more hours and more weeks uh, um, than the women with different sex partners. Um, they also uh, uh, the the ones who have not ever been married to men actually are the ones who seem to be doing better. Um, and uh, that's probably because as a career, they have not taken time off uh, or as much time off anyway, you know, to raise children or to uh, to, to work in the home uh, uh, compared with uh, with heterosexual women. Um, so it's actually, we do. You can also see. You can Sorry, say that again. Who is doing the work in the household, right? Well, that's harder because they don't ask very much about that. Um, but but there's still a lot of there's still a lot of equality in in the sense that there are more in female couples. Both partners work more often than for for different sex couples. Although in the U.S., most people in different sex couples also both partners are working. Um, but um, uh, we still see differences in earnings between the partners and lesbian couples. So there's, you know, the, the egalitarian model that we have is, and, and maybe sometimes in our heads, doesn't always work in real life that people do have different earnings. And so, you know, it's interesting to think, does that influence the bargaining power of the two women in, in the couple? Uh, does it influence who decides to stay home with the kid? Um, and uh, we're starting to get a few studies. There's one that's really interesting one in Sweden by Ilva Moberg. I don't know if you've ever met her at IAPI, our feminist economics group, but she, she followed Swedish uh, lesbian couples who had children and uh, different sex couples who had children and showed that once people had kids, for both couples, you know, the gap opened up in earnings, like the partner who stayed in the workplace uh, who is the man in different sex couples, you know, had much higher earnings years later than the, than the female partner. And the lesbian couples, uh, that happened for a while, but they tended to come back together. You know, so this is important for thinking about the gender wage gap overall. A lot of people say that most of it now really is about a care penalty for women who stay home with their kids. And so we see that for straight couples, but for the lesbian couples, we don't. We see that, you know, kind of reconverging. And, uh, um, after one has a kid. One reason might be for some lesbian couples, the, the other partner has a child later. So Ilva shows that <laughs> in her paper, uh, which is which is quite interesting. You know, that that is a level of, you know, kind of sharing of the labor of parenting that uh, is not exactly possible for different sex couples. But, you know, but uh, for lesbian couples it seems to be important for trying to maintain some balance of equity in the relationships. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff you can see in, in some of these economic studies. Yes, but yeah, I mean, what what I also think is very, very cool that you can see is uh, now it, it sounded very good that on, you know, on average, the individual lesbian woman earns more than the straight woman, but then you get these things that add up that are not so fortunate, like you have double gender pay gap, you have, right, right. say one is, uh, for instance, uh, you know, non-gender conforming, then, you know, the penalty gets higher. Say if the women are not white, then you get the race penalty and you get double race gen, uh, pay gap. Yeah. And then, of course, if, if somebody is, is trans, then there is also a much higher gap. And these things, in, for instance, uh, about trans women, it's very hard to see in, in the census data because that's not asked, right? right. So right. 
to complement this uh, large scale samples where you can directly compare the straight people with the queer people, you can do the snowball service like the one you talked about the fundamental rights agency, where only queer people are questioned and very specifically right. on how they're doing so I think it's good to have both types of data ready to look into discrimination and then also the effects that is having. Of course, both uh, types of data have disadvantage, but it is very interesting. For instance, if you wanted to see how are black lesbian women living with children in rural Tennessee doing compared to, you know, a uh, single PhD student in say, in New York City, then this is really helpful, right? But uh, for instance, the, there's huge problems for trans lesbians. It's huge. It's really, really difficult for them. And then it's it's very interesting to to combine these large scale numbers with uh, more specific, more precise experiences that might not be there in these large numbers. But then. Of course, this is very important to have there. And I think in your book, you also illustrated the, the data with uh, stories from, from people in different regions. We also have one question for activists who want to use that 1% number that we're losing 1% of GDP. Is that mm -hmm. true for all countries or just for the US? And how is, is, is this different in the different countries or what's going on? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to know. Um, the studies that that, that one percent comes from are the ones from India and the Philippines, Kenya, South Africa. Um, there's been some work done in Canada. It's a, it's a little bit dated and only looks at health. So uh, so it's I would say it's more of a rule of thumb than an actual finding for a country like the U.S. or other other countries besides those five or six. Um, but it gives you uh, just an idea about how. Uh, those differences can add up very quickly. So um, if you are in a country where you have pretty good data um, and can measure some of these gaps in education or health or, uh, or employment, then you know, there's the possibility to try to do a study that would you know, also kind of add those up. So it is possible to do that. It's, it's fairly, in some ways it's fairly simple. I know uh, now I'm still doing a little bit of work with the World Bank and they're trying to uh, to do this in Serbia uh, and some other countries. So they're uh, working on new models that can be applied in different places. So, uh, so if you have questions about a particular country, you know, I, I, you can email me, you know, and I can kind of uh, give you a sense of kind of how you might go about uh, even doing that. You don't have to be an economist to be able to kind of show that these are, uh, that these are real and potentially very large numbers. I mean, the good thing is that, you know, if you want to do, for instance, a press statement and you can say, wow, in our country, we're losing 1% of GDP, that is X billion dollars. That would mean 20,000 jobs, 30,000 jobs, um, and maybe, you know, deflection of environmental degradation or something like this, you know, you can make it into really good statements. But it's nice to have actual numbers that a university yeah. professor made yeah. rather than you'd be like, I think the number is 12, you know, that's usually not so helpful, right? <laughs> yeah, but, well, that's right, exactly. I mean, that's, that's one reason why I wrote the book is that it gives somebody, you know, who wants to make this argument, you know, sort of a baseline, something to, to quote. And, and my argument is that this is almost surely an underestimate because there's so many things that we couldn't actually estimate. So for example, Differences in education. We don't really have the data in different places to be able to create that estimate. So that's not in any of those. Uh, so if we were able to sort of see, you know, how people are held back uh, from contributing to the economy because they're getting less education, that would that would make this number even bigger. So it's a pretty conservative estimate, I think, on the one percent. I can see at the moment there are not so many more questions coming. Okay. Please ask us questions on the Facebook. You can just uh, write the questions on Facebook and I'm trusting that they will come to us somehow. <laughs> um, so. Hey, let's talk about, let's talk some more about data. Do you like to talk about data? Can, can, can we talk a little more about data? <laughs> oh, sure, let's talk about data, okay. I mean, yes, I mean, I, I, I dream about data. So, but, but I guess, you know, we've been talking a little bit about it in different ways and about how important it is. And I think, um, 
as a as an academic and a scholar, I think you know how how much more we need because there's so many things that we want to know about the lives of LGBT people. And you you had a great outline just a few minutes ago about all the things we don't really know. Um, how how could we get data you know that would allow us to look at the position of trans people, for example? Uh, how could we get data that would give us more insight in, into uh, into you know the position of lesbians and that double discrimination. So uh, so I've also been involved with this project called the LGBTI Inclusion Index, kind of globally, not so much in the U.S. yet, but globally, you know, intersex people get added to the LGBT acronym, and uh, the United Nations Development Program and the World Bank have been trying to uh, to create this index that would give us a way to um, to compare. Uh, how countries are doing on LGBT inclusion. So there, there would be measures on legal rights. There would be measures on kind of administrative rights, you know, being able to, uh, uh, for trans people to change their names, for example, to change their, their documentation. Um, uh, they, so on top of that, we're trying to look at measures of how people are living, what people's lives are really like. So looking at poverty rates for LGBT people, looking at, um, looking at their earnings, looking at their health status, how well they're doing in education, what sorts of challenges they're facing, do they experience violence? Uh, so all these different measures that will give us a, uh, an overview of how people are doing that we can follow over time. So anyway, in order to do that though, <laughs> we've got to have data that we can compare across countries and that's what's really hard. We can look at laws, we can look a little bit at public opinion. We have some data there, but when it really gets down to these questions of, of our economic equality, our health equality, how, how can we do that? So I think it's gonna take um, partnerships between uh, people who are activists uh, and researchers, people who are in government statistical agencies, people who are working at some of these international uh, organizations like the UN, uh, uh, maybe even people in businesses, you know, who want to know more about kind of these issues. But anyway, it's going to take partnerships for us to to get together and make the case to our uh, to our governments that we need more data and we need we need that to be an investment by governments. So, you know, we have these sustainable development goals where we're supposed to be tracking how well we're doing uh, over time in terms of uh, in, in terms of reducing poverty and increasing gender equity and uh, being more sustainable so our environment uh, is better. Uh, so all of these require data, but we don't have any data on the LGBT side to, to kind of go along with it. So anyway, so so the, I think there's a lot of potential for partnerships. Uh, yeah, and, I'm very glad you're saying that with the, the partnership, because um, I think uh, one criticism that usually arises when you're like just comparing countries, it Economists love doing that, but we shouldn't do that. They shouldn't let us do that on our own. You know, we should have <laughs> other, other disciplines there to do that with, right? Because, you know, even though the numbers for a certain country might be really, really bad, given like human rights and so on and so on, that might be the case because there had been colonization and, you know, our European norms from 200 years ago were imposed on that country and they're still stuck there. And now that country is doing really badly in our index, but it's basically, you know, a historical process that caused that. So these things should be unraveled. Otherwise, these like rankings are really unfair and not very helpful either, right? Yeah. So yeah. We, should, we should try to get help from political scientists or, you know, colonial students or something like that to, to help us to not just here is the data and here's a number and now this country is like bad you know so that that is something we have to be very careful about and i think economists are the last discipline really to say no no we can do everything on our own we are you know we have our silo and we don't need to reach out so i think this is what I personally also like so much about feminist economics, we're interacting with gender studies and we're interacting with other disciplines like historians, very important to always see how did we get there? And then I think yes. we need to get the future researchers, you know, it's like where are we gonna get with this, you know, with the knowledge we're producing, why is it there and where can it lead us? So I think we should 
if you're listening to this and you're not an economist, that's really good because we need other people to bring our work to the world. Otherwise, it's really usually potentially harmful, <laughs> let's say that. What do you think? It certainly can be, yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree for the need to have many other perspectives on the data. And I think that is the nice thing about our, our International Association for Feminist Economics is that we do have economists with, who come from many traditions and ways of looking at data. So, yeah. so that is good. But I also just want to say, I always want to make a plug for, uh, I think in some ways the, the best, uh, uh, the, the people who are most committed to doing careful, thorough studies that take into account all of these different perspectives, often are people who were once or continue to be activists. I mean, I think I would love to see more economists, more activists become economists to kind of bring their knowledge and, and their, you know, their desire to understand and to change things into our field. That would make a huge difference, I think. Mm. I mean, I think we as uh, international feminist economists, we have been trying to broaden this like every year we have a conference in a different place in the world and this year we were going to go to Ecuador and of course the conference was cancelled due to COVID but I mean this for me personally it would have been a really good opportunity to you know connect with the indigenous activists in Ecuador and Bolivia and because this is where economics needs to look now you know this horrible stuff that's happening with the mining the deforestation the you know, resource depletion and the extraction of all the species and all this, you know, this is where we need to have our alliances. And I think um, being lesbian activists or trans activists, it's very important to, to reach out to other suppressed groups because, you know, if you've been there and you, you should mm -hmm. get the drive together. And I'm very sad that this is not happening this year and maybe next year it will happen if possible, but I'm really worried at this point of time. It's it's a little late, you know, to postpone things. It's always really late. So yeah. yeah. But that's a very sad ending. So we should Oh wait, somebody has another question. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. Any tips or advice for activists who want to partner or find funding <laughs> to collate data? I think that there are uh internationally now, they're they're starting uh to be some funders who are interested in data. Um, I think uh, finding that can can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. There's a uh, what's it called the Global Philanthropy Project uh, is a group that actually collects data on who's who's funding different kinds of things around the world on LGBT issues. Um, and I think uh, you can see who some of those big funders are. A lot, some of them are in the U.S. Uh, but I think there are um, there are opportunities. I, my own. Uh, uh, my own tips, I guess, and advice would be to try to, to find people in uh, local universities where you live um, who might be interested in this. They, you know, they may not be the most uh, senior, uh, senior economists or sociologists or people in the business faculty, for example, if you're interested in economic issues. Um, but, but finding folks who, uh, who either already have some knowledge or who are interested in expanding their work uh, in these areas or even graduate students, you know, people who have some research skills can be very helpful in knowing how to think about research questions and set up research projects. Um, my, my work with, uh, with activists has, uh, I've always been very impressed by how much thought activists have put into the world and why it is the way that it is. And so I think uh, sharing that knowledge, that experiential knowledge with researchers is often a really good thing. And then, you know, we both bring things to the table that can be very attractive as a package for these funders, because a lot of the funders that I know about want to know that the research is something that is desired by the, uh, by the local community, and it's something that they're prepared to use. Um, so if you come together with researchers and go forward for this kind of funding, I think you, know, you can make a very strong case for some of those those funders uh, in, in different parts of the world. So, uh, you know, so I would encourage people to look at that Global Philanthropy Project uh, study. They just came out with a, an updated one recently, and uh, and you can see uh, you know you can see the funders in the United States, Arcus, the Arcus Foundation funds in other places, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, um, 
I'm trying to think of other examples. Uh, there, there are just a whole bunch of them uh, where, where I think there's some opportunities. Yay, Lee, you got another question. Uh, what changes in society should we aim for to have the biggest impact, e.g. in the fields of education, health, or work? That sounds like a question from another economist. Yeah, where would we have the biggest impact? You know, it's hard to say. They're all connected. Um, I think that uh, um, I think that probably the thing to do is to to look in your uh, whatever place you're working in, in your country, in your city, uh, whatever is relevant, and and look at where where things are already happening. Because I think you sort of need all three of those to be uh, to uh, some awareness of the needs for uh, LGBT people in all three of those contexts and pressure in all of those contexts to uh, put that together. Um, so, uh, you know, my own sense is that uh, in academia, the health research is the farthest along um, and the education and economic work much less so. Uh, so I think, you know, maybe sometimes those are, those are better uh, places maybe to start, but uh, but I think it really depends on, you know, what you already have going. So, so making sure that, that, you know, all three of those, if you, if you want to have the biggest economic impact, you want to lift all three of those up and make sure that people are seeing how they're connected. I think it would be maybe even like, you know, a good idea to tie it into a common policy. Like, what do you want the education for? What type of work are you seeking to create? What health are you looking for? So for instance, you could say, all right, we're gonna have a policy aim of you know, sustainable environmental economics, and then you should streamline all the fields to like work for that. You know, if we if you educate people in environmental awareness and then you create a lot of innovation in green technology. And then that will improve the health also, you know, because uh, environmental degradation falls out. So I think it's important to have a, a policy goal. Where do you want to go with this? Do you want to start a dictatorship? Then, you know, maybe less in the education and more, to, you know, but that's, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it really depends where you want to go with all this. Yeah. It, economics yeah, I mean, is just for those in power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of places that I've seen have also used um, use survey tools to do needs assessments um, to try to understand where the people that they're working with sort of see the biggest need. And so I think that's the other nice thing about about survey tools. You can you can use one survey and you can ask about those needs, and you can also learn about the people that you're working with to see where their challenges are. Um, so that's that's one way. If you're not sure, if you don't have kind of that clear overarching goal that Karen's talking about, you can you can use those same tools to to help you figure out the best direction. Hmm. I don't see any more questions, but I have a question. Oh yes, I do see another question. Aha. Okay. Um, you we've been talking a lot about here it came something else uh, about. Um, LGBTI, what do you think is uh, most burning for specifically lesbian women? I'm saying lesbian with the star, including trans and whatever. Mm -hmm. So lesbian issues, what do you see is the most burning for lesbian issues? The single most burning issue, it's sort of hard to say, I think globally, but to me, the thing about uh, thinking about lesbians, it's different from some of the other groups is that uh, we also have to be concerned about how women in general are treated in those, uh, in those kinds of settings. Um, countries that have laws that still you know, differentiate between men and women for land ownership or inheritance rights or something like that, those kinds of underlying issues will have a big impact on what's possible for lesbians, I think. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's something to keep in mind that uh, working for women's rights often is going to open up more space for lesbians to be able to live their lives uh, in the way that they want to. Uh, and uh, so that that is a little bit different. Um, I would say specifically, um, you know, for lesbians, uh, um, I think that it's likely, yeah, it's sort of hard to know, because in each of these different areas, I think that, that there are specifics. I mean, I think on the education side of things, there's so much misogyny that is built into homophobia in educational settings about bullying people because of 
being gender nonconforming in some way. Um, I think uh, for uh, in the workplace, uh, you know, you know, lesbians look like they're doing well, but we know that they're still facing discrimination. Uh, and in the health settings, you know, lesbians have some unique um, healthcare needs in certain kinds of cases. So, uh, so there's definitely you know specifics in each of those areas. But I would say the one overarching thing that I see, having looked at a lot of the evidence around the world now, lesbians are still often invisible. Uh, uh, we'll have you know huge countries like India that'll do studies that have very few lesbians in them. Uh, like uh, so, uh, you know, where if you've got a country of one point something billion people, you know, why are you looking at surveys that only have you know 300 lesbians in them? Where where is everybody else? Uh, so so I think that that visibility is something we have to fight for um, always in all cases. Uh, and I think the other thing is that a lot around the world, a lot, some of this work is being done because, uh, uh, because a lot of the international agencies and, and government agencies are not so attuned to LGBT issues. The front door is, or maybe this is more the back door, the back door to thinking about LGBT issues is through HIV. So who's highlighted in HIV? Well, they have to you know, look at key populations. We're talking about gay men, bisexual men, trans women, uh, often uh, in particular. And again, who gets left out? Lesbians get left out. Bisexual women get left out. Trans men get left out. Uh, so, um, so I think we have to always be thinking, where are the lesbians uh, in all of these cases? Because sometimes they're really hard to see. Yeah, and then of course it's uh, important to, uh, especially in solidarity issues, like some countries have it really hard right now. For instance, next to Austria, Hungary is going really in a bad way with, you know, yeah. making trans rights, abolishing trans rights. So we we have to help the most vulnerable parts of our lesbian community to, you know, stay afloat. And the same goes with uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, I mean, being a lesbian is it's not a single issue thing. So we have yeah. to use the, the privilege that we have and then go to especially those parts of our communities that need our support. And I think we can use a lot more studies on trans lesbians. There's very little out there. And then also often in our snowball samples, like in the fundamental rights agency that has this huge survey with so many mm -hmm. data, we don't reach those who don't use the internet, which is often very older women or older people per se, or ill-educated people, people that are poor and don't have a computer, maybe have children and don't have the time to fill out those services that take a lot, a lot of time. So for us, it would be very interesting to consider how to reach those people that are most vulnerable. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we're just scraping the service and we, we're getting those that are easily accessible and the others are just invisible, as you're saying. Yeah, that's a really important point. That's right. Uh, because there's also variation in economic status within our communities too. And we don't want to all do the thing to them that we're complaining about everybody else doing, which is making, making people invisible. Yeah, so how can we uh, increase the outreach for lesbians to include them in the data collection? How can we do that? Well, I think some of it is, you know, uh, organizations that have a lot of lesbians that focus on lesbian issues need to be involved uh, in survey data collection. And, uh, you know, that's probably the, the best way. I don't think, uh, you know, where I see the biggest problems are where it's a, you know, maybe an HIV related NGO or an NGO that's mostly gay men, you know, kind of taking on a survey and finding that it's really hard to find lesbians. <laughs> it's because they're, you know, they're looking in the wrong places. They don't have the connections. They don't have the credibility in the community. So it really is important. I mean, that's why it's so important to have organizations that are focused on, on lesbian issues. Yeah, yeah. So maybe this is a very good point uh, to thank ELC for all the work they're doing. Yes. The ELC is a huge network of not only European and Central Asian countries, but we're reaching, we're trying to reach out and to get, uh, you know, regional contacts and so on and so on. So I think by this activist bottom-up movement, we can 
reach more lesbian women and find out more about them and their local situations, which is very exciting and new. And I think there is a lot of space left for us to do way more research and way more work on that and find out things that have not even been talked about before because we just didn't know the data or things that are happening. So if there are no very burning questions anymore popping up, I don't see them. So I would <laughs> love to thank you, Lee, for being with us today. Um, it was very exciting. And Thanks, yeah, this was really fun. Yeah, I hope to see you soon, somehow, somewhere. So. Yes, Let's hope big hugs. Be virtual. Right. <laughs> and please be safe in the US. We haven't talked about the horrible things going on there. And I think the time has really run out. Please be safe. Please have a good election preparation process. And <laughs> So much from now, if you have any more questions for Lee or for myself, you can uh, post them in Facebook and we will look at this at some point and try to give you answers and you can find us on the web and email us maybe, right? Yes. Thank you, LC, for having us. And I think we're done here. Have a very good afternoon, evening, morning and talk to you later.